All right, my dudes, I hope we're all doing well today. We are going to be diving right into the Animation Recreation 3 tutorial now, so let's go. We're gonna create a new project, just overwrite a previous save there and create a new composition. And we have our basic standard setup, 1920 by 1080, square pixel aspect ratio at 25 frames per second. And our duration is gonna be three seconds and 10 frames long. We'll hit okay for that. Then we're gonna bring in our reference footage. So file, import file, we'll grab our reference footage here. We can download that from our canvas page. And then we're also going to bring in our Illustrator file that we made for our assets here. Remembering of course to change import as from footage to composition retain layer sizes. And then we can double click on the comp that is open there. And we are now looking at our layers. Okay, so now in terms of the layers, let's just quickly discuss that. Some people did not sort of recognize to make a large blue square and a small yellow circle for the opening sort of portion of the animation. If that's the case, that's perfectly fine. Either jump into Illustrator quickly and update your file and re-import it, or you can just make the square and the circle here in After Effects today. That's also uh, perfectly allowed. Okay. So we're going to bring our reference footage in and drag it at the top of our timeline. I'm gonna increase our scale until it fills the entire screen. So we'll take it to about 335% of scale. I'm just gonna turn off the uh, audio for that reference footage and leave it like that. Okay, so what uh, we have here in our animation is essentially two stages in our animation. We've got our first stage where we have a blue square rotating in on a red background with a streak of gold shooting around inside of it. And that then cuts to a second stage where we then have these moving pieces all sort of building up and scaling away as it progresses. And we're gonna treat these as two separate pieces. And this is a great opportunity to introduce you guys to the concept of using multiple compositions in an animation. So up until now, we've only ever used one composition per animation and composition is essentially what we're sitting in right now. All of your layers are sitting inside of the recreation comp, whatever that title is that is underlined, that's your composition that we're working in right now. The great thing about compositions is that they can have multiple, com uh, multiple other comp uh, compositions inside of them. So I like to equate it to working with boxes. Inside of our first box, we have all of the layers that we need for our animation, but we could also have many smaller boxes, which also then contain their own layers. And we're gonna be using that sort of method to e easily build this animation to get around this transition that we see over here. Okay, so the first thing that we're going to do is we're gonna come along to one second, eight frames on our timeline, and we're gonna grab our reference footage. And we're gonna split duplicate this. So essentially it gets cut off and that's going to then allow us to separate these into our boxes. We're actually gonna to go to one second nine frames here. And we're gonna hit Command or Control Shift D. And that will then split duplicate the layer, essentially cutting it along where our indicator is. We then have the second portion of the reference video. I'm just gonna drag and drop that at the bottom of my screen, at the bottom of the layer stack. And now our top three layers is our reference footage, our yellow dot that we'll be using and the blue square that we'll be using for that starting introduction. So with those top three layers selected, we are then going to right click on them and select pre-compose, fifth option from the bottom. And what we're essentially telling After Effects is take these layers and put them in their own box. We're gonna call this stage one and just make sure that you turn on open new comp. And we're gonna say, okay. And we're now looking at a new composition now containing only three layers. You'll see at the top of your timeline panel that we're now looking at stage one. We can jump back over to our normal comp or the original comp rather by just clicking on the tab. And we can now see that there is a layer on layer one called stage one. You can turn its audio off because there is no audio and that's now colored in sort of sandstone. And if we double click on that, it takes us back into stage one. So we can jump back and forth quite easily. Okay. The next thing that we're gonna do is grab the rest of our layers. So deselecting stage one and grabbing everything else. We're gonna pre-compose these as well. And we're gonna call this stage two. And that way it is now set up so we can dive right in when we get to this point. All right, let's go over to stage one and see what we're actually going to be making. We can start off by coming out to the 
one second eight frame mark and we're going to hit n for nato to end our timeline there that shortens our work area bar we're then going to right click on that bar and select trim comp to work area which then now sets that space as our entire timeline so we're only going to be focusing on this first portion we're going to start off by focusing on our blue square bouncing around and then we'll do the yellow sort of streak or the yellow ball that's causing that effect there so let's take a look at how we can go about doing this I recommend that if you need to make your layers that you come on over to about one seconds three frames just so that you can get the size of the yellow circle that we need um, I'm actually going to need to scale up my assets uh, my yellow circle so I'm just going to move that to the top of my timeline and I can just see it there just increasing my size and just put that back down there and then I'll come across to one second 19 frames and I'll just have my blue square at the top of my reference footage so I can see it here I can see that I need to scale mine up slightly and just reposition it and make those changes like so okay so with these changes now made Another easy way that we can go about working with these layers is if we change our opacity, hitting T for opacity, down to 50%, we can still see the reference footage through our layer. So we can actually build our position keyframes just by doing that. So I think that's what we'll do first. Taking a look, it uh, rotates and scales in, and it gets to its final scale size at frame 10. So we're going to start off with a position keyframe on frame 10 of the timeline. And we're also then going to hit shift and hit S for scale. We're going to have our scale keyframe on uh, frame 10 as well. And then our rotation, we're going to have a rotation keyframe on frame 11. And we'll have that at zero degrees. Okay. So working backwards, we might as well just do this portion first. We're going to change our rotation to be, uh, I believe it's a negative 180 degrees. That will have it rotating in clockwise as it appears on screen. So very first keyframe is negative 180 degrees. And then we're going to increase our scale. And something that I want to point out, I'm just going to bring my opacity back up so I can make this point. Now that I've scaled the square so high, it's just about to fill the entire screen. We can see that the edges are getting a little bit fuzzy, which uh, is obviously to be expected as we blow things larger than we made them in the original file, they're going to pixelate as they go. But because this is an Illustrator file and because this is something that is a vector file, if we come on over to our layer and we turn on this little box over here immediately to the right of the mushroom that we turn up and on to make the layer shy, that is called continuous rasterization. You'll notice as you turn that sun icon on, your edges become very sharp. All right, so as long as we remember to turn this feature on, we'll do it for the yellow circle as well. That way, regardless of what size we scale these shapes to, we're never gonna get pixelated edges. Okay, so with that demonstrated, I'll just finish scaling it up. I'll just take it to about 330%, I suppose and that then rotates as it's appearing on screen so that's great we're happy with that so far and uh, we can apply easing to the scale and rotation okay next we're going to do the uh, position keyframes and these need to be set to toggle hold so i'm going to apply toggle hold keyframe to my first position key on frame 10 and I'm just going to bring my opacity back down to 50 so I can see through my shape. Okay. As we move forward, we can see that there's no smooth transition between the jumps of the square. So it's bouncing up and down quite jaggedly, which is why we're applying toggle hold. So we're going to then move over to frame 12. In fact, I just want to make sure I might need to shift my square up slightly just to recenter it there. There we go. So going to then frame 12, we're just going to move our box down. We're essentially just moving our shape over the image that we have here. Um, it then moves again at frame 14. So we'll move that up there. Uh, then it's frame 15. So immediately one frame later, it moves up. Just zoom in here and see. 
It then moves over to the right on frame 17. And it moves down on frame 19. And then it starts scaling from there. So then we're good with those keys. So it bounces around the screen a little bit. And then in terms of scale, from frame 21, we're gonna have a scale keyframe. It's gonna make an empty one by clicking on my empty keyframe button there. And we're gonna say that that fills the entire screen at one second, five frames. So we're just gonna increase our scale to fill the entire screen again. By 335% should be fine. Okay. With that, I'm gonna increase my opacity back up to 100% so that I only see my block and it now bounces around quite nicely and then scales. Okay, I'm gonna move this blue square down to the very bottom of the layer stack. I'm gonna close it and I'm going to lock it. Next up is our yellow circle. I'm gonna move that above my reference footage so that I can see it. And we're gonna come back to the very beginning of the timeline. Okay, so the yellow streak first appears on frame 10, which means that our first keyframe needs to be on the ninth frame. So I'm gonna hit P for position and create a position keyframe. And notably, we're not going to be applying easing to a majority of these frames. So we're just going to leave that in a diamond form there. It then bounces in. And if we take a look on frame 12, we can actually see it's made contact and already ricocheted off of the shape at this point. So we're going to have to actually go back by a frame and just fill in with our imagination what happened in the interim. So on frame 11, we're going to bring our yellow circle down and have it strike the inside of our blue square. We're also going to grab our convert vertex tool and we're going to remove the handles so that those don't become a problem later. Okay, then we're going to go to frame 12 and we're going to place our ball on top of the front of that gold streak where it's colliding with the left hand side of our square. If we take a look then at frame 15, the same thing has just occurred. So we've missed the initial point of contact. It's already moved beyond it. So we're gonna have to go to frame 14 and just try and follow the path that we see being formed over here. And then we're gonna go to frame 17 and we're gonna strike here. Then we're gonna go to frame 19 and strike bottom center of the square. And then finally come to rest at the one second mark, one second, two frames. So at one second, two frames, we're just gonna shift it straight up into the air like so. Okay, turning off my visual footage now, what we're gonna take a look at doing is just making sure we're actually making contact with the sides of this square. So I'm going to go over each of my position keyframes and just check. I might need to slightly shift them up. We don't want to create the illusion or give the sense that it's going too far out of the box or staying too far in. It needs to actually collide with the edge. Okay. Some minor adjustments there. There. And there. Okay, so if we play this back, we now have our ball shooting around inside. And it actually looks as though our box is reacting to that, responding to those um, sort of points of contact. So that's looking fine. What we're going to do is we are going to apply easing to the very last keyframe. So we're going to slap on some easing there. We're going to dive into the graph editor. It looks a little bit strange, but all we're going to do is just push the handle all the way to the left. So that way it rises up quite quickly and then eases into its final position. Might even make a sharp peak like that. Okay. With that done, we can then apply the effect that creates that sort of streaking yellow that we see in our reference footage. So we are going to come to our effects and presets panel. If that's not open, you can always come up to window and select the effects and presets panel option from here. And that will then open up a list of effects and presets that we have inside of After Effects. We're going to click on the search bar and we are going to type in echo, E-C-H-O. And you'll see there it finds something called echo under time. 
Now we're going to apply this effect to our yellow circle. We can go about doing this in a number of ways, but the easiest is simply to have your layer selected and to then double click on the effect. It will automatically then add the effect to that layer. Now, two things have happened. The first is that instead of looking at our project panel, we now have the effect controls panel. And that is just open for us with all of the effects that are sort of all the properties rather of the effect that we've just applied. Also, we've got the word effects having appeared in our layer panel. And if we open that up and go into echo, we have all the same effects that we see in the project tab, um, in the effects control, sorry. I'm going to work down here in the timeline just so that if this didn't open for someone, they don't get left behind. All right. So in terms of our echo, the first thing that we're going to change is the echo time. Right now it is set to negative 0.033. And if you scroll around, you'll see that that means that there is a sort of single echoed thing chasing our ball around the screen. I'm just gonna place it here where we can actually then see it. We're gonna change our echo time to minus 0.001. Okay, so it's minus 0.001. Very important that you put the minus in. If you put in the minus, it has our echo streaking behind the character. And if we have a positive value, it shoots the echo streaking ahead of the actual movement of the shape. So then that wouldn't work with our box. We then go to the number of echoes and we're gonna change that to be 40 for zero creates a nice long streak there. And then the last thing we're gonna change is echo operator. We're gonna click the drop down that currently says add and we are going to choose composite in front. And that gives us a solid yellow streak. And if you play that, we now have a cool streaking motion done quite easily. Okay. With that done, we then just need to do the scaling of our yellow ball to finish it off. So I'm just going to hit Shift S for scale. And uh, actually I'm gonna hit U first just to collapse everything. And then I'll hit U again to bring up position, Shift S to bring up scale, get rid of all that other information. Okay, taking a look at our video footage then, we just wanna take a look at the scaling. So, it starts scaling from one second, three frames. So we'll have our scale keyframe at one second, three frames. And it's then going to increase until we get to one second, eight frames. I'm just gonna turn on my layer and scale it all the way up to there. Okay, and once again, just to demonstrate, notice as soon as I turn off that constant rasterization button, how bad the asset looks. So it really is fantastic that we have that as a feature. Okay, so we've got our scaling. We're just going to apply some easing to that. And what we're going to do is we're going to have a peak over to the left-hand side, like so. Uh, let me just correct myself. It might be over to the other side. This one always confuses me. Yeah, slightly, sorry, we're gonna have it over to the right-hand side. The reason is that way it's going to be picking up, it's uh, gonna be scaling up faster as it progresses. And then we, when we jump cut to the second stage, it's gonna look a lot better. Okay, so we've got that set up there. And we are now finished with our stage one. We just need to create a background so that all of this isn't just happening in black space. So I'm going to turn on my video reference and we're gonna come on up to layer new solid. And we're then going to sample the red from the background in our reference footage. And we're gonna call this solid BG for background. And just say, okay. And we're gonna drop that at the very bottom of the timeline or the layer stack so that our assets are now existing in red. Okay. And with that, we are finished. We can lock all of these layers, remembering to turn off the visibility for the recreation reference footage. Okay, let's then move on over to stage two. And in fact, I'd recommend saving at this point, just in case we don't wanna risk losing our work. Okay, so over at stage two, we just need to kind of prep up our file again. So the first thing we're gonna do is grab our video reference footage and drag it all the way over to the left so that it begins at the start of our timeline. So we'll see that playing out in the background. 
and then we're going to come over to one second 15 frames we're going to hit n for nato so that we shorten that workspace and then trim comp to work area all right so for this portion what we're going to start off by doing is just setting up our layers a little bit better just guaranteeing that they're in the right space essentially so we're going to move on over to one second six frames I'm going to have my video reference at the bottom of the layer stack and I'm gonna lock it so I can't interact with it. And what we're gonna do then is we're just going to reposition our assets and scale them up as necessary just so that we can follow the reference a little bit easier. Okay. So now I've kind of just scaled things up, repositioned them slightly, and uh, this is going to also allow us to just follow along a little bit better, I think. Okay, so what we're going to do now is kind of just break down how this is going to work. So just taking my reference footage back up to the top of the layer stack, so that's all I see. It's easy to be distracted and quite sort of put off by how intense all the scaling is because so many things are scaling in unison and doing their own thing. But we can actually get away with scaling all of these things at the same time with a null object after we've animated all of the other little moving pieces. So by breaking it down into smaller steps, it becomes a lot easier to actually manage. And that's what we're gonna be doing. We're gonna start off by animating our red triangle. So I'm going to turn off all of my other layers except for the blue square and the red triangle. And I'm just keeping the blue square on as a point of reference at this point. I can actually just lock the blue square because we're not going to be animating anything on it. Okay, so in our recreation, ignoring how this is scaling back and forth and going in and out, what we're going to take a look at is the fact that our red triangle rotates counterclockwise into screen coming from above and lands in its final position on frame 15. Okay, so what we're gonna do then is turn off our visual reference. We're gonna grab the red triangle and hit P for position and shift R for rotation. And we're gonna make those keyframes there. We can go ahead and apply easing to these as well. Okay, we're then gonna go back to the very beginning of the timeline and we're simply gonna shift our red triangle up into the air, not completely off screen, but close and it's rotating counterclockwise, so we need a positive rotation value. So we're gonna have a rotation of plus 180, 180 degrees. And that has our triangle then rotating in and essentially docking in that final position. Okay, and if we take a further look, that's literally all that it does. So right now we are finished with our red triangle. We can lock and close that. And let's do another easy one. I think we'll do the pink circle next. So that's my magenta circle here. I've got it on screen and the magenta circle also docks at frame 15. So that's also pretty easy to do. We're just gonna hit P for position, create a position keyframe and apply easing to it. And I'm gonna head on over to the very beginning of the timeline. And we're just gonna drag this all the way over to the left. There we go, and we'll just sit there and ease its way in. Taking a look at our reference, that's all it does. So we can then call that layer finished as well. Let's do the red circle next. That one's also pretty simple. That one docks at frame six, actually, a lot sooner than all the other layers. Gets into its final position there. So we're gonna go over to frame six and grab our red circle and hit P for position and create a position keyframe on frame six. We'll apply easing to it. And we're gonna come back to the beginning of the timeline and just drag the ball down to sit at the bottom of the screen. And then that one's finished as well. Then the next one to do is going to be our red cross. So let's focus on that one next. Now the red cross comes in from the left-hand side of the screen and it gets to its final position at frame, I would say frame 10 moves into its final position. That smaller change we see there is just a result of the scaling. So we are then going to grab our red cross, if I can find that, and hit P for position. And we're gonna create a position keyframe on frame 10. 
go back to the very beginning of the timeline and we're just going to drag this out to sit below our pink circle. And we can somehow just apply easing to these as well. Okay, so we've got the position change. Then we need the rotation because there's a little bit of rotation going on as this scales in and in and away. So on frame 18, it ticks over leaning to the right by about 20 degrees. So we need a rotation keyframe on frame 17. So we're going to hit shift R for rotation and create rotation of zero degrees on frame 17. And we'll just apply easing to that. Now, this acts as a bit of visual um, anticipation, essentially, for when it then rotates in the opposite direction. To help further ex uh, accentuate that anticipation, rather than having it rotate over a single frame, we're going to give it the two frames because it holds that for another frame there. So we're going to go to frame 19 and create our next rotation there, giving the viewer an opportunity to actually see it spinning. Okay. We're going to type in a rotation for our red uh, cross of 20 degrees. Okay, so that's 20 degrees there on frame 19. Then, taking a look, we then rotate anti-clockwise and get to its end rotation at 1 second 6 frames. So at 1 second 6 frames, we're going to have a rotation value of minus 90, minus 90 degrees. And that has it doing a quarter anti-clockwise rotation there. Okay. And we can then call this one finished. I'm going to lock it. Well, I'm going to hit R for rotation to only show the rotation keyframes. And then I'll lock it. Because they're going to help us guide out for the blue cross. Okay. So turning on our reference here. Taking a look at our blue cross layer. That comes in from the right hand side of the screen. It gets to its final position. I think we can also call that at frame 10. So we're going to grab our blue cross and hit P for position and create a position keyframe on frame 10. We'll just apply easing to that. Then we're going to go back to the very beginning of the timeline and we're going to grab our blue cross and just push it across to the right hand side of the screen there, just so that that's where it enters from essentially. Okay, then it holds that position until frame 12. So we're going to have an empty position keyframe on frame 12. And then it starts to move down slightly in response to the scaling of the magenta rectangle. And it gets to its final position at 16 frames. So kind of just eyeballing to see the difference between the left hand arm and the top of the square. I'm just going to zoom in and bring it straight down and I think it goes to about there okay so that's our position on frame 16 it then holds that position until we get to frame 21 so we're gonna have an empty position keyframe on frame 21 and then it goes straight back up into the air and it gets to the top back to its resting point at one second six frames so at one second, six frames, I'm just going to move it straight back up. And in fact, in order to make sure I get it exactly where I want it, I'm just going to select my second position keyframe and copy and paste it onto one second, six frames. And that guarantees it comes back up to its resting point. All right. Then we need to do our rotation. And it's the exact same rotation times as the red cross. So it occurs at the exact same points we place the red cross rotations. It's just that the rotation goes in the opposite direction. So at frame 17, we're going to create our first rotation keyframe of zero degrees. I'm going to apply easing to that. We're then going to move over to frame 19, and we're going to type in a value of minus 20 degrees rotation. So that's minus 20 degrees on frame 19. And then we're going to go to one second, six frames, and we're going to type in a value of nine zero. So that's positive 90 degrees rotation. And that then has it rotating while it's moving up. Okay. And with that, our two crosses are now finished. We can call those done. Collapse and lock them. I also recommend saving. 
Okay, so then the last things that we need to do are our outlines. Now, unfortunately, we're not actually going to be able to use the illustrator layers that we made for these outlines. Let me demonstrate why. As soon as we try to animate our magenta rectangle scaling, for example, it's going to deform the outlines of our stroke, essentially. So there's unfortunately, as far as I know, no way around this. So what we're going to do is just take a little bit of extra time and we're going to draw these two shapes in After Effects so that we can play with them a little bit differently. Okay, so I'm going to put that back to its original size and I'm going to just turn on both of these layers. I'm going to mark them in red just so that I know that I'm not going to be working with them. And I'm going to take them to the bottom of the timeline just so that they will be out the way once we've drawn our new shapes and then I can lock them. Then we're going to grab our rectangle tool. Shortcut for this is Q. Make sure that the fill is set to none. Make sure that the stroke is set to a solid color. And I'm going to set the color to white for now. And I'm going to bring its pixels for the stroke down to 10 just so I can actually see what I'm drawing. Okay. So holding down shift, I'm just going to click and drag to create a perfect square for these outlines here. Try and just align it so that the line of my outline is in the center of the stroke, essentially. And that creates a new layer called shape layer one. I'm going to rename this to blue outlines. Just so I know what it is. If I zoom out slightly, you'll then see that the shape, its anchor point is sitting in the center of the screen. So we can fix that quickly by just holding down command or control and double clicking on the pan behind tool to automatically center our anchor point there. Then what we can do is we're going to sample our color. So I'm going to grab my rectangle tool again, and then I can access the fill and stroke options. I'm going to sample the color of the blue that I have. And I'm going to increase the stroke thickness to 35 pixels. Okay, so I now have a large blue square outline, which I can collapse and lock. And then I'm going to turn off the visibility for the illustrator layer that I just used as reference. Okay, then we'll grab our rectangle tool yet again, making sure that nothing is selected. I'm just going to make my color white once again and bring its stroke back down to 10 so I can see what I'm doing. And I'm going to click and drag to draw our pink square or rectangle. I'm going to call this pink outlines. Holding down command or control, I'm going to double click on the pan behind tool to center its anchor point. And then I can grab the rectangle tool and change its color. And I can also change its thickness to 35. And then I'll remember to turn off the illustrator layer that I just use as reference. Okay, so we've now made two shape layers. You can tell the difference between the shape layer and the illustrator layer by the little image that is to the left of the name. A little star image for a shape layer and a little illustrator thumbnail to show you that those are illustrator files. All right, then what we need to do is we are going to move our shapes to sit below our reference footage. I'm going to turn off the visibility for my pink outlines and lock them for now. And we're going to take a look at how to animate this blue outline. So first thing to notice is when it first appears on screen, our shape is uh, quite large. In fact, it hasn't yet scaled down to a perfect circle that only happens over the course of a few frames. So we need to start by increasing its size. And that's an important phrase, size, because it's different from actually changing its scale. If I were to just demonstrate with its scale, the fact that it's an After Effects layer doesn't mean anything. It's still deforming the edges. However, if we go inside of our layer, inside of contents, inside of rectangle one, inside of rectangle one path, we have the option for size. And now size affects the actual outline of the shape layer. So it's going to make it larger or smaller without changing the thickness of the stroke. What we're going to do is unlink the size value and we're going to push the second size number, regardless of what that is, we're going to push it up to 500 and that stretches out our rectangle. Okay. 
Regardless of where you are on the timeline, just make a size keyframe so that we can animate this later. And then selecting the main layer, you can hit P for position and create a position keyframe wherever you are on the timeline. We'll move that now. And then you can hit U for uniform to show both the size and position keyframes. Okay, so starting off, let's see where this actually ends when it's in its final sort of position. So it gets to its final docking point at frame 15. Okay, so we're going to move our position keyframe to frame 15. And we're just going to zoom in here and bring up our rulers. I'm going to place a guide that's just touching the top of that red circle. And I can then bring down my square. This is where it's going to move to, just so that the top of my square is touching the guide we've now just placed. And we can apply easing to that position keyframe. Okay. Taking a look at our reference, if we go back to the beginning, it comes in from below. So we're going to go to the very beginning of the timeline and we're just going to click and drag this layer down so that it's sitting at the bottom of the screen like so. Okay, that's going to have it rising into its position there. Then in terms of its actual scaling, we need to go to frame 19. Frame 19 is where we're going to have our size keyframe and we're going to apply easing to that as well. And we're going to create an empty position keyframe. I'll explain why in a moment. You can then see that it decreases in scale until we get to frame 21 when it becomes a perfect square. So what I'm going to do to get my shape being a perfect square right now is on frame 21, I'm just going to click to select the first value for my size and I'm going to copy it. And then I'm going to click on my second value and paste it in there. So it makes it a perfect square again. Now you'll see by scaling it down, it's scaling towards its center mass. Unfortunately, the size does not react to where we've placed the anchor point. So even if we moved the anchor point up to the top, it wouldn't affect that, unfortunately, which is why we need the position keyframe. So also on frame 21, we're going to then have our square move up so that the top of it is still touching that guide that we've placed. And if we now scrub over these two frames, we get the illusion of it essentially staying in place. It's a little bit of a change there, but I can affect that by actually just removing easing, I suppose, from these. Let's see if that works. Yeah, so by removing easing from these keyframes, it's only taking place over two frames anyway. It now doesn't accidentally jump up due to the easing. Okay, so that's that for our rounded rect or our <laughs> rounded rectangle. Sorry, it's been a long day. That's it for our blue outlines. That one's finished. If I turn off my reference and play it back, that's not doing its thing. And something that we might do as well, just to help this just look a little bit nicer, I think it might help just moving our first set of size and uh, the third position keyframe just one frame so it's got three frames to occur just giving it a little bit more of a smooth feeling to it okay let's save that and then we are going to do the final shape our pink outlines okay and we can actually help our pink outlines if we grab one of the crosses that we have I'm going to grab that blue cross and hit U for uniform just to bring up its keyframes and then I'll lock it again because we can use it to help guide us as well. Okay, so our pink rectangle appears on screen from below and it docks in its final position on frame 10. We can see that that is now sitting slightly lower than the corner of that square. So I'm going to move the shape, let me unlock it and hit P for position. I'm going to move it down slightly just to recreate that slight gap there. And I'm going to hit P for position and create a keyframe and apply easing. We're then going to go to the very beginning of the timeline and we're just going to drag the shape straight down. So it's essentially just sitting flush with everything at the bottom. So that has it coming onto the screen. Then taking a look, it starts to scale down in terms of its size. So we're going to have to go inside of the layer into the contents inside rectangle one, inside rectangle one path. And let's just create a size keyframe and unlink the two values. 
We can then hit U for uniform and that will then only show our keyframes. And I think we can apply easing to this one. Okay, so it starts scaling down in terms of its size from frame 12. That's where we're going to put our uh, size keyframe and we don't need a spare position keyframe because this one does actually move towards its center mass. It then scales down and gets to its smallest size at just want to see here I think we can call it that one there at frame 16. So at frame 16 we're then just going to decrease its height until it's down to about that. So that's fine. Maybe take it to about 50. Okay. It then holds that size until we get to frame 22. So we're going to have an empty size keyframe on frame 22. And then it scales back up again. Oh, sorry. Actually, we're going to go off of the guide as well. It's actually on frame 21. Okay, so on frame 21, just in line with the um, position keyframe for our blue cross. Then we go over to one second, six frames, and I'm just going to copy my very first size keyframe and paste it on one second, six frames. And if we take a look now, that should scale quite nicely in time to the cross. Okay. And with that, our shapes are done. We're not going to dive into the graph editor. Feel free if you'd like to, but uh, it's not absolutely necessary at this point. And I'm sure this tutorial has gone on long enough. So the last things that we need to make now are a background and then the scaling in and out effect that we see with a null object. So I'm going to turn on my reference footage just so I can see that nice shade of yellow. We're going to come on up to layer new solid and we are going to sample that yellow and call this one BG as well. Say OK. And we'll drop that background at the very bottom of the layer stack. So now our shapes exist in that lovely shade. OK. Then we need our null objects. So what we're going to do is just first lock our reference footage. I'm going to unlock all the layers that I have keyframes on and lock the two layers we aren't using and the background. So now I only have my main layers actually unlocked. Then we're going to come on up. I'm just going to turn off the visual reference for now as well. we'll. Come on up to layer, new, and create a null object. That automatically gets centered in the screen for me. And uh, I'll just leave it red for today. I'm going to label that as scale null, just so that I know what it does. Okay. And we're going to then select all of our shapes. And we're going to parent those to our scale null. So right now, layers three down to 10. I'm going to click and drag my pick whip tool, parent them to the scale null. And what I'm also going to do while my layers are all selected is I'm going to turn on the constant rasterization option for the illustrator layers that we are using. So that when we scale them, we're not going to have any pixelation issues. Okay. In terms of scale, it's a little bit difficult to figure out how to go about doing this one. But the way that I've found is to simply start around the middle to finish it off because there's a nice sort of actual transition between the scale at the end. And at the very beginning, it's very blocky. It's almost stepped out. So we'll be doing a lot of toggle hold keyframes on the scale there. We're going to go to one second, six frames. That's where if I turn off my visual reference, it's a little bit of discrepancy there, but it's okay. It's within the realms of reason. I'm now focusing on my center blue square as my point of reference as I jump between my reference footage and my assets to now check their scales. We're going to go to, um, let's check on our timeline here. We're going to go back to one second, one frame. And we're going to check, we might need to decrease our scale for the scale null to about 95% turning on and off the visual reference, just seeing the size of the blue square. So that's about right. We'll have a scale keyframe for our scale null reading 95%. It might depend also on yours to so just kind of check that the, the scale is looking right there. But uh, about 95% on one second, one frame. And we can apply easing to this one. Okay. 
let's finish off the ending and then we'll kind of take it from there. So we then go to the very end of the timeline. So that's one second, 15 frames. And we're going to increase the size of our null until that blue square fills up the entire screen. So feel free to take it to like 1,100%. Okay, so that has it scaling there. And what we can do is just so we don't have to do it later, let's just quickly dive into the graph editor and we're gonna set it up so that there's a peak on the left. Yeah, I think a peak on the left should work. Or check myself before I wreck myself, what would it look like on the right? No, look better on the left. Okay, so I peek on the left hand side. Cool. So we've got the ending of our animation now sorted. Let's then check our reference and we're going to now be working backwards. And what we're looking for now is there's a point where it's kind of step scale, it steps down, and then it steps again, and then it actually sort of transitions smoothly. So we're looking for that second last step. And that's occurring on frame 18. So on frame 18, we're going to create an empty scale keyframe. And uh, we're going to then check our size here. So that needs to increase to maybe about 130. I'll call it 130%. We can leave this one on easing as well, because there's actually going to be a smooth transition here. Okay. Then doing the scale for our next step. So we're going to jump over to frame 17 and we're going to create a scale keyframe here. And we're going to apply toggle hold to that. Okay. And that one in terms of our scale might be about 170 maybe. Yeah. So we'll make that 170% on frame 17 with toggle hold keyframe applied. Then we're going to go to frame 15 and we're going to create a empty keyframe with toggle hold applied. And we're going to increase our scale to, let's see here, I think 200 will work for that. Okay, then moving backwards along the timeline, we're going to go to frame 10. We're going to create another keyframe and apply toggle hold. And we're going to increase this to 230, I believe. Yeah. So on frame 10, we have a toggle hold keyframe reading 230%. Then we're going to go to frame 7, create a scale keyframe, and apply toggle hold. Increase that to 270, maybe. Call it 275. That looks about right. So on frame seven, we've got scale of 275% with toggle hold applied. Taking a look at our reference, we're almost done. We're going to then come over to frame two. We'll see between frame one and frame two, it actually scales up. So we can go to the very beginning of the timeline I just want to see if that is the case. Um, frame three. Sorry, so we're going to come to frame three. And we're going to make an empty keyframe on frame three at 275%, but we're not going to apply toggle hold to this one. We're going to leave this one with easing. And then we're going to go to the very beginning of the timeline and create an eased keyframe of 210 maybe, let's call it 210, 210%. Okay, so now that was a, a little bit confusing, but it, uh, I find it easier than going forwards along the timeline. So if I run through these again, we have an eased keyframe at 210% at the very beginning of our timeline. We then have an eased keyframe at 275% at three frames. So our shape increases over three frames. We then have a toggle hold keyframe reading 275% on frame seven. Moving along to frame 10, another toggle hold keyframe reading 230%. 
Moving to frame 15, another toggle hold keyframe, reading 200%. Moving to frame 17, our last toggle hold keyframe, reading 170%. 100, uh, sorry, frame 18, we've got a reading of 130%. Easing has been applied. That goes down to one second, one frame, and our scale is 95% there. And then at one second, 15 frames, it is back up to 1,100 to fill the entire screen. And with that, the second stage of our animation would appear to be finished. Let's save. And then remembering to keep the visual reference layer turned off, we can lock everything and save. Okay. So now we're going to dive into our main composition. So this is what we need to now render. We just need to stitch the two together and then we'll be able to render it out. You'll notice now that stage one and stage two, the layers are shorter than they initially were. And this is because when we were inside of the composition, we trimmed the length of its timeline, which then shortened the actual layer itself. Okay. And all we need to do here is just drag stage two out so that it ends as stage one finishes and then just transition like so. We can come on over to two seconds, 24 frames and hit N for NATO to end our timeline. And we're then going to just trim comp to work area. And if you play this back, we now have a lovely sharp jump cut between the two stages. All right. And with that, we are now finished. So as I've said, you need to render the Recreation 3 assets or this main composition in order to get the entire video. Please don't make the mistake of rendering out just stage one or just stage two. Make sure that you're in Recreation assets when you set up the export options. Okay, and with that, we are finished. I wish you a great night further and I'll catch you guys in the next one. Ciao.